Drums and percussion are the world's oldest instruments. Since ancient times, drums have played a major role in society. For example, in Africa, they were used to communicate across long distances and were used to call soldiers to war, to accompany dancers, and to accompany religious ceremonial activities. And today, in many parts of the world, these activities are still in use. The drums are at once primal and futuristic. No other instrument has this quality or power. The drum set came into prominence in the early 1900s with the innovation by the Ludwig Drum Company of an efficient, transportable bass drum pedal. At that point, the concept really took off. Before that, groups either used a couple of drummers playing kind of a military style, like in a fife and drum group from the Mississippi Delta, or one person playing some kind of percussion like a tambourine or juba, also known as ham bone which is when a person is basically playing body percussion, making different sounds by playing on chest, belly, thighs, and clapping of the hands. So this was the closest thing to the sound of a drum set prior to the advent of the bass drum pedal. During the ragtime era, drummers would actually use the snare drum as a ride instrument. There were no hi-hats and the only cymbals of the time were Chinese. So the drummer used kind of a buzz roll to create a percussive bed for the other musicians while playing ragtime and Dixieland. The 1930s saw the invention of the hi-hat called at the time the low boy and the beginnings of the big band era, in which the drumming styles changed to a more 4-4 jazz motif, as opposed to the boom chuck of the 2-4 style in ragtime playing. Also, it was during the 30s that we see cymbals being manufactured specifically for use on the drum set. This era also spawned the use of floor toms. One of the first drummers to play this new kind of expanded drum set was the venerable William Chick Webb, born in Baltimore around 1907. And despite physical deformity caused by tuberculosis of the spine, Chick became the top drummer of the early big band era. And his band became mainstays at the Savoy Ballroom in New York City. And in 1934, bands, the band's popularity took a big jump with the discovery of singing sensation Ella Fitzgerald. Many of the drummers of the day, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, were profoundly influenced by Chick Webb and created a tribal kind of feel in the music by using floor toms to great effect. Another great innovator of the 30s was Papa Joe Jones with the Count Basie Band. He was a master of the hi-hat and of the brushes. And by the 1940s, the drum set had evolved to pretty much what it is today. Uh, the 40s saw the emergence of bebop as a major force in music. Such drummers as Max Roach, the drummer with the Charlie Parker Quintet, Kenny Clark also came onto the scene and kicked the art of drumming up several notches. Max Roach was the first credited with really thinking compositionally and soloing by use of melody and soloing over song form and he is the composer of many creative pieces for a percussion ensemble. Kenny Clark was an innovator of the ride cymbal in jazz. He was an amazing accompanist who always served the music and grooved really hard. These drummers and many others helped to shape the way the world looked at the drum set. We thought it'd be a really good idea for you to know a little bit about the construction of a drum and how to get it to sound good before you really start playing it. So while we've got a drum taken apart here, ready for tuning, let's talk a little bit about how it's made. So we got this drum shell, and basically the way they construct a drum shell is to lay out sheets of veneer and they will 
cross laminate these plies of very thin wood. Then they put it around a mold and glue it together and fix it so that it's perfectly round. It's like probably a double, double mold on it to keep it perfectly round. And the uh, plies are all glued together. And so they have this big long sausage into which they will cut drums out of, drum shells out of. And they can be, that makes them, they can make them any depth. Like this one I think is a nine by 12. This is nine inches in depth. Some, they can be 10 by 12 or eight by 12. So what we call this part of the drum here is the bearing edge. And this is where the head seats onto the drum. The bearing edges can vary in the angle that they're cut. And they usually cut these things on a special router. There's a special tool that sits on a table that spins around, it's like a, a little blade. And they'll take the shell and run it around the router like that to cut this bearing edge. How much of the bearing edge touches the shell affects the sound. The more the, bear, the more the bearing edge touches the shell, the more overtones you're going to hear in the drum. The less of it that touches the shell, the more pure tone you're going to get out of the drum. And this particular shell is a, a, rounded, a rounded edge, and a minimal amount of it touches, so you get this nice mix of overtones and pure tone in these beautiful Pearl Reference Series drums. Let's talk about some other drum parts here. These little pieces right here are called tension rod casings. Some people call them lugs. And they are basically screwed onto the drum. There's a hole drilled into the shell the, t the tension rod casing is inserted and, a screw and screwed in from the inside of the drum. And the little piece that the tension rod goes inside, that's called a swivel nut. Okay. Now, we also have a sound hole here. This allows just a little bit of the air to escape when the drum is, is struck. Um, and here we have on this Pearl Reference series there, Optimount isol Rims Isolation System. And this basically fixes it so that the tom mount does not come into contact with the drum. And this really increases the resonance of the drum considerably. Um, many, many drum manufacturers are going to this kind of system now Whereas before, the actual tom mount was built on the side of the drum. They drilled a big hole in, in the drum and you inserted the tom mount in. And it would, when the drum hangs like that, it impedes the resonance of the shell. But this isolation system, this Optimount isolation system, renders the drum very resonant because there's no impeding of the resonance by uh, anything inserted into the drum shell. So that's a really great thing, a great innovation. Okay, <clears throat> now this is a drum hoop right here. This particular one is a die cast hoop, which means that it was formed in a die, a cast was formed, and into it molten metal was poured, and you have this very rigid, very sturdy kind of hoop and they tend to hold their tuning really well, but you have to be careful when you're tuning with a die cast hoop because very minute changes in the tuning on one side of the drum can really affect the tuning on the other, can affect the tension on the other side. So you have to be kind of careful about your evenness of tuning. Die cast hoops on snare drums are really great for nice loud rim shots. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great kind of hoop, very, kind of, very expensive hoop. Okay, so 
drum finishes. Now this is a, a polyurethane finish. Uh, some drums are covered in like uh, uh, polyvinyl covering. Uh, makes them a little less expensive, but this is an actual actual polyurethane finish over wood. You can actually see the features of the wood through this finish. <laughs> 